Uh, my name is John Lakos, and a long time ago, to 1996, I wrote this book called Large Scale C++ Software Design. And there's some techniques in there that are actually still effective, haven't changed much, they've changed a little. This is the updated version of that, uh, with a little preamble to basics of uh, physical design. And I know it says advanced levelization techniques, but I also included insulation techniques just because. And then we're going to talk about how we do component-based development on a real-world project. So this goes for three hours. And the first hour and a half is going to be pretty much all uh, levelization. And then the next hour and a half is going to be a combination of the two. <coughs> so with that, I'll get started. Copyright notice. Um, this is the abstract, but since you guys are already here, I assume I don't need to go over this, so I'll put it on the screen for a moment so people know what's going on. And uh, I don't know what's going on with that, but it's been doing that. All right, so what's the problem? So large-scale C++ software design is multidimensional. It involves logical and physical design. Physical design is something that I talk about a lot in the, in the book and, and something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, we need to be able to isolate a modular functionality within discrete fine-grained physical components. Um, we need to be able to delineate in English logical behavior precisely while manage to, managing to keep the physical dependencies among these uh, subordinate components acyclic, which is really the, the purpose of this talk, and in fact, keep them under control. And there are a lot of rules that govern logical and physical software design, and we're going to talk about a lot of those rules today. So the purpose of this talk is review the basics of component-based design, and this is just a quick sketch so you can get an idea of where we're going. And then we're going to introduce levelization and insulation techniques that apply to present-day real-world examples. Uh, and in the end, we'll see, as I said, an example of how we go about designing levelized systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also am getting over a bad case of bronchitis, so I apologize if I'm coughing throughout this talk. So this is the outline. The big one is two. Uh, so we'll get started. Um, this is my... Uh, the way I represent logical and physical design uh, as an icon, the, the oval is the logical part, and it's contained within the physical part, which is the rectangle. Logical classes and functions, physical files and libraries. So if you look at these uh, components, they contain logical content. And this is my little sketch to show you what I mean by that. But the components stack up on top of each other. And here's an example or the archetype here is the, the, the blueprint for a component. It consists of an implementation file and, and a header file, and associated with each component is a standalone test driver. There is a rich discussion of how we write tests and test drivers, and unfortunately that is not part of this talk. But this is our fundamental unit of both logical and physical design. And everything that we write that isn't main is implemented in terms of these wonderful beasts. So it's not just a .h.cpp pair. Um, there are four properties that make a .h.cpp pair a component. And the first one is that the CPP file includes its H file as the first substantive line of code. Now, can somebody tell me why it is that I make sure that I include the .h file as the first substantive line of code? Yes, ma'am. It's important that somebody do it. So right. That you can check it compiles. That's very good. That's, it's important that somebody does it so that we know that it compiles in isolation. And so even if the CPP file is otherwise empty, we always include it in the CPP file. Uh, the other thing is, Occasionally, people will say we will, don't really need a CPP file, and the discussions about whether or not we need one that recur over and over and over and over again are, are dwarfed by just, uh, uh, just saying we're always going to have it, we're not going to worry about it, and that's our standard canonical rendering, physical rendering. The second one is all logical constructs having external linkage defined in a CPP file are declared in the corresponding .h file. Um, well, first we have to understand what we mean by linkage, 
And before we do that, we need to understand what we mean by declared and defined. So when I say something's declared, what does it mean to say, what is a declaration? Let me just start with that. What do we mean by a declaration? What does it do? Something exists somewhere. Something exists somewhere, okay. Um, let's say we go with it introduces a name into a scope. Now a definition may also be a declaration, and it might not be, but the definition is what describes the, the storage or whatever, or whatever properties that we're going to make use of. And what this is saying is that if, oh now I have to talk about linkage. Linkage is a logical property of the C++ language that says if I have two declarations in different translation units and they refer to the same object, then that object has external linkage. If an object has internal linkage, that is not possible. So we make a distinction between things that can span translation units and things that can't. And the purpose of this rule is to say, if you've got something in the CPP file that, that can logically mean something outside of the uh, component, then you need to declare it in the header file so at the source level, people can see it and it's not slipping out at the ABI level. So the next one, and I'm going over this rather quickly because it is a long presentation. Um, constructs having external or dual bindage. Now bindage isn't a real word, I made it up because linkage was taken. What I mean by bindage is uh, how, how the uh, use of a name is bound to its definition. So if I use something somewhere and then, and then it's defined somewhere else, what tool is typically responsible for doing that? So if I have um, something that is always resolved by the compiler, I say it as internal link, uh, bindage. If I have something that is always resolved by the linker, then I say it has external bindage. And then there are a couple of constructs in C++ that might be resolved by the compiler, or they might be resolved by the linker. And I say that those, those constructs have dual bindage. Would anybody care to venture a guess as to what one or both of those dual bindage constructs are? Inline function. Inline function. How about the other one? Constant expressions? Sorry, const? Const expressions. Const expressions. It's not what I had in mind. Uh, well, templates. So templates and inline functions are something that the compiler can see because they're in the header file. And, <clears throat> and if, if the compiler wants to inline them, they can, in, in which case the compiler copies it in, the binding takes place right there, and we're all good. But if the compiler says, no, I don't want to do that, then it leaves it for the linker to resolve. And so that is a, that is a dual bindage uh, 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 construct. And so now we're saying if a construct has anything other than internal bindage, we do not want to declare it locally in any component where the definition doesn't <coughs> exist as well. In other words, you want to say forward declaration or local declaration. There are no local declarations of anything other than internal bindage things. Okay, that gives us a notion of where something lives, what component defines it. And that's important for us to understand how to discuss physical dependencies. <clears throat> and finally, a component's functionality is accessed via a pound include of its header and never via a forward extern declaration. So this is just wrapping, well, this is saying it's possible, now do it, don't go around. Uh, the reason for this one is if we follow that rule, apart from a lot of other good things that happen, we can extract the physical dependency graph from the pound includes alone very, very quickly. Until we had Clang, this was just out of the question, and now that it's in question, it's still, you know, orders of magnitude more expensive to do by parsing everything. Whereas this can be done on a very large scale very, very quickly, provided we follow these rules. Okay, any questions on that before I go on? That's sort of the fundamental step one. That's what a component is. If it doesn't follow that, it's not a component. Okay? All right. So now, we're going to look at logical relationships. And here I have an example that appeals to your intuition more than anything else. Um, we would not normally have what we call value types 
deriving from abstract interfaces. But in this case, we're going to make an exception for uh, uh, didactic purposes. And so we're going to say that we have a shape, and a shape is an abstract uh, interface, and a polygon is a kind of shape, and we can get the origin from any shape by asking for the origin. So uh, a polygon, of course, we can insert vertices into, into it, so there's a relationship between point and polygon, and polygon is implemented in terms of point list. And it turns out that there's a helper uh, class inside the same component as the point list, and in our convention, when we have an underscore, as you see there, it means that that class is private to the component. It's not allowed to be used outside. And there are reasons why we don't use nested classes for this purpose, but I'm going to leave that out for now. This is, this is just to describe the notation. So, is a polygon is a shape, and you'll notice it's bubble to bubble, not box to box, because it's a logical relationship. Now, polygon uses point in the interface. Now, what does it mean to use something in the interface? So, if a function uses a type in its interface, it means that it names it as part of its signature or as part of its return type. If a class uses a type in its interface, it means that one or more of its member functions uses that type in its interface. So, polygon uses point in its interface and we indicate it like that. Okay. Now, if you look at point list and point list link, they also use point in their interfaces like that. So far, so good. Does this make some intuitive sense? Okay. And then, polygon uses point list, but not in a way that you can detect it. It's not programmatically accessible to know that polygon uses point list. That's the whole point of encapsulation. So we say polygon uses point list in the implementation. Something uses something in the implementation, it does not use it in the interface. Something uses something in the interface, it uses it in the implementation, with one exception, which we're about to see. <coughs> now, notice point list uses point list link somehow. So we say that as well. There's a difference. The polygon uses point list and it spans component boundaries, whereas the point list uses point list link and it doesn't span comp uh, component boundaries. I see a question in the back. Um, how would you represent uh, uh, where I have a private member that's declared it, or defined, declared in the class definition in the header file that it's the only place in the header file where that type is referenced but it's used internally in the implementation. I'm not sure I understand the question. Could you say it again? Okay, I have a type, mm -hmm. uh, and it has a member variable of another type. In the class definition, that type is not referenced anywhere else. It's only used... It's used, okay, so I think what you're saying is if I have something that is not used anywhere but within the class, right, that would be this case. We could have made point list link nested within point list. Okay. We choose not to do that because nesting a class within a class and the friendship that ensues and all of that um, goes against what we're trying to do which is to expose the dependencies even within a component. So if you have something within something you can't really talk about it because it's incestuous. So we take it apart, we spread it out and we say like let's, let's see what's really going on. The way that C++ works is forgive me, a little backwards from what it's supposed to be. So, wh what, it, what I think it should be. So, by doing this, we keep everything at the same level. We don't have public, protected, public, protected, private, private like that. We, we just have one level. And in fact, a lot of this talk is about keeping things at the same distance from the root in terms of how we aggregate. So, that's why we do things like that. Now, keep in mind that, that when I designed this in 1990, Four, you know, we didn't have all of the magic. It, uh, nested classes didn't even work. But even though they work now, they don't quite work the way I want them to. And that does. So again, let's, let's, the last one here is uses in name only. Now shape is an abstract interface. And so it uh, uh, collaborates with point because I can return a point by value from shape. But I don't need to know anything about point because there's no implementation in shape. 
So the way we do this is we use this funny symbol. This is uses in the interface in name only. And in fact, it doesn't use it in the implementation. Very strange case. This happens pretty much only when you're doing crazy levelization techniques or with abstract interfaces. <coughs> Excuse me. Come on in. You're late. All right. Uh, so moving on, now we're going to say these logical relationships imply physical dependencies. So, is a implies a physical dependency between this component and this one. I think we realize if we don't have shape, we're not compiling polygon, right? Same with polygon using point in the interface. It uses it for real. Same over here, right? It's using it in the interface. Same here, using it in the implementation. There's no consequence of point list using point list link in the implementation because it doesn't span a component boundary. Now notice there isn't a dependency here because uses in name only does not require an include. A forward declaration is good enough. And the reason we use forward declarations is for insulating implementation details. Level numbers. Once we have this diagram, we can assign level numbers based on the dependencies alone. We don't care about the logical relationships anymore. We know the physical dependencies. So point is at level one. So is shape. There is no physical dependency. Point list is at level two. It depends on something at level one, but nothing higher. Polygon depends on something at level one and at level two, therefore it's at level three. Nothing magical about this. Okay. Essential design rules. There are two. What do you think the two most important component design rules are? We heard about the properties. What are the two most important design rules? <coughs> Number one. Something to do with flat, flat hierarchies? That's more of a strategy, but no. There's a design rule among components. What is it? No cycles? There you go. No cycles. As soon as you start having cyclic physical dependencies, it's all over. You can't scale it. It does not scale. And this entire talk is about techniques to avoid that and then after we've done that worrying about compile time coupling. So if, if you're talking about a, a very small program, this is not the right talk. If you're talking about very large programs, this is the right talk. All right. The other one is no long distance friendships. And what that means is we don't allow friendships to span a physical boundary. So friendships are kept local to a component. That means you're going to have to design things differently than you might have otherwise, and that's okay. You will learn how to do that. It's painful, but it's, 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 in, it's in your best interest because otherwise what happens is you check something out, you make a change that's completely compatible with its, with its contract and interface, you check it back in, and something else at a higher level that had private access breaks your code. And that can be arbitrarily far away. So the further away, the, the worse, the, the farther you, you go outside of a component declaring a friend, the, the, the more uh, 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 unmaintainable the code base becomes. And of course, if it's pervasive, you know, it's just more is worse. But these are the two big ones we never violate. Now, criteria for co-locating public classes. We talked about private classes. They don't count. So when would I ever want to have two classes in the same component? And there are four reasons. The reason I make it like this and say there are only four reasons is if, if we, we start collecting lots of components in lots of classes in one component for no good reason, instead of having fine grain modularity, we have coarse grain modularity. For coarse grain modularity doesn't allow us to compose exactly what we need and reuse things in a, in a crisp way. It means that if we need something, we basically have to pull in everything. So we don't want to do that. It's not a matter of convenience. It's a matter of necessity. So there are four reasons. The first one is friendship. Obviously, if I have two things that require private access, one requires private access of the other, then they have to be in the same component so they don't violate that rule. And one of the most important ones is iterators. So iterators are granted access to the container or vice versa. The container is granted access to the private constructor of the iterator 
so that as a unit, they can provide the open close principle, which means I can iterate through my component and write whatever kind of algorithm I want without having to go and invade the component, the class there, and do something to it. So iteration is really a prime example of where we would have two classes, two public classes in the same component. <coughs> Cyclic dependency. If you are incapable of breaking a cycle, but you always are, there has never been a case in the history of my existence that I couldn't break a cycle. So if you're not able to do it, you would be forced to put two classes in the same component. But you are able to do that. Single solution. Now, before C++11, we didn't have variadic templates. We didn't have uh, 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 as much power in the language. And there are other languages that don't have this power. So you might need to have multiple constructs that together solve a single problem but don't depend on each other. They're simply collaborative. And that's what we refer to as single solution. And it's okay to put them in the same component because it doesn't make any sense to divide them into different components because you'd always have to include all of them anyway. So that's not the point. Now the other one, not to be confused, suppose I have a, a coordinate, and then I have a, a point, a box, a box collection, and a garage. And you say, well, I would never be able to use a box collection without a box, so let me put the box in the same component as the box collection. And that's wrong-minded, because there are a lot of people that can use a point without a box. There are a lot of people that use a box without a box collection, and so you want to split them up. This is a bad idea. You want to keep them separate because the bottom one is reusable independent of the ones on the top. So again, we don't put things together just because, because it's convenient, because they might be used together. No. We keep them fine grain, deliberately fine grain. Now, the fourth one is called flea on an elephant. And this is an engineering compromise between listening to what I just said and getting your job done. Sometimes you'll have a very small syntactic construct like a scoped guard that, that, that uh, initializes a logger, which is a big, heavy piece of machinery. And putting the scoped guard in a separate component because you can is not the right answer. The usage example for the logger will include the scoped guard because the scoped guard is going to be instantiated at the top of main. And when, when main goes out of scope, the logger is going to be destroyed. And so this is OK. There is no additional dependency or girth added to this and the elephant doesn't mind and anybody who wants an elephant is happy to take an elephant with a flea on it. Now, somebody wants a flea and there, first of all, the flea would not be happy if the elephant was on it and second of all, if somebody wanted a flea and they had to drag around this elephant, that's no good. So we separate these two. Imagine this is a point and this is a graphical engine. We would put these in separate components. Now, Warning, um, th this is, <laughs> that's a bad idea. The warning is people can abuse this and they can say, well, it's almost a flea. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of like a mouse or maybe it's a goat. The elephant's maybe like a cow and they try to make up these, these th things. And no, we don't do that. No, no goats on pigs. It has to be a flea on an elephant. And if it's any more than a flea on an elephant, you have to put it in separate components. Okay, so five levels of physical dependency. As we talked about before, um, uh, this is one level of physical aggregation. The thing at the top is allowed to depend on anything below it. The things on the bottom aren't allowed to depend on anything in between. This component can depend on this and this and this directly if it wants to. We don't have strict layers. When we get to the second level of aggregation, we're talking about packages of components. And we specify this in metadata. We don't just deduce it. We could, but we don't. Why don't we just deduce it? Can anybody tell me why we don't just look at our code and say, I know what the dependencies from here to here are, so I'll just extract it? Any ideas? Because we don't know. We just think we know. Okay, that's a, that's a good answer. We don't know, but we think we know. Another answer is, when we start out, we don't have anything. We're, we're just designing it. So when we initially start out, we specify the physical design, and then we fill it in 
And if we get it wrong, as Marshall suggested, the tools will tell us. But without the redundancy of the metadata, the tools won't tell us anything, except perhaps that we have a cycle. But this is way in advance of the cycle. This is trying to design something up front. So here is a, a collection of package dependencies, a group of packages, if you will. And so this is the second level of aggregation. And now we look at the third level. And the third level of aggregation is a package group. And you might say, well, why do we stop at just that? And there are empirical reasons for doing that, practical reasons. And there are also um, engineering reasons why packages have certain very interesting properties and package groups have very interesting properties. Packages um, have a single namespace and package groups have a single envelope of dependencies, whereas they might not follow the same logical um, uh, uh, cohesion. So if you think about it, uh, a component is like a city and a package is like a country and everybody speaks the same language and does the same thing in that country. But all of the countries in Europe are on the same landmass and share the same envelope of physical dependencies. And so package groups really do define a large chunk of envelope of physical dependencies. Now, if we didn't do this, we'd have something like this where we just have little things and very large things all mixed together and this doesn't work well. This is hard to understand for human beings. It's hard to find things, it's hard to reason about so we don't do this. We say we have a component, a package, and a package group, and we don't release individual components. We release, sometimes we release package size things, sometimes we release package group size things, but there are exactly three levels, and if we want to do something like this, we don't bake it into one piece, we separate it into a hierarchy of package groups. Again, exactly three levels of physical aggregation, and this gives us certain benefits uh, which we will talk about shortly. Um, actually, I think it might be in the second half. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Because we're through the first part. Go ahead. Yeah, would a component potentially be part of multiple packages? Would a component be part of multiple packages? No. A component would be part of exactly one package. All right, here's some more questions. <coughs> If you don't know the answer to all of these, please raise your hand and ask the question that you'd like to ask. Just so I'm clear on level numbers, I understood when you were numbering the one, two, three, and later on you had a, you know, a stack with bottom level. Are those the same levels? Are we talking about the level numbers you were using before is the same as your... Yes, the level numbers, the level numbers are determined by first extracting the logical dependencies, then the physical dependencies, then you have a graph. If the graph has a cycle, it's not able to be assigned level numbers in, 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 in an obvious way. But if it doesn't have cycles, it is. You start with the things that don't depend on anything else, you assign them one. Then you look for things that depend on only those things at level one, there too, and so on. Things that are outside of your local region are level zero. Yes? What happens if two packages both want to have a point class? What happens if two packages both want to have a point class? That is an awesome question. They don't need to have it, they need to have access to it. Right? They don't need to own it. If they both need to own it, then they're probably applications. <clears throat> and then they're going to be fiddling with it. But, but then th that's, that's, that's not in your big infrastructure. That's in your app world. When people need to change things all the time, that's way at the top. They're, they're applications. They don't want anybody else to share. They're changing it all the time for business reasons. And we want to keep that as small as possible. So... It's, if everybody wants to use a point class, then we need to find the right place for it in the physical hierarchy. And it's not in one package or the other. That's, you'll see. That will come up very soon. It's our second levelization technique. All right, so I'm going to ask a question. This one. How do we extract component dependencies efficiently? I told you. How do we do it? Was it avoiding the use of external and creating that graph 
the By avoiding the use of extern, yes, that was part of it. Did you have an idea? I was going to say grep for pound include. Grep for pound include if you avoid the extern, which is the reason for the design, the properties of a .h.cpp pair. So with those properties, we can do that. We can just do it with, by grepping for the envelope of, of pound includes. It requires an upfront design choice. You can't do that in general. But again, this is not in general. This is designed with malice of forethought. We thought about this 20 years ago. We designed everything exactly according to this. We get certain benefits. Okay? All right. So, <coughs> any other questions before I go on to the heavy duty stuff? That was just the intro, right? That's just review, tutorial, whatever. This stuff is a little bit different. So I invented this horrible word a long time ago. Horrible words have certain advantages. Uh, this doesn't exist anywhere else, so if you Google it or something, I suppose it would, it would come up uniquely. Um, I haven't tried that, though. Levelize. We need to levelize that design, i.e. we need to make its physical dependency graph acyclic. Levelizable. Are you sure that design is levelizable, i.e., do we know how to make its physical dependency graph acyclic? Levelization. What levelization techniques would you use, i.e., what techniques would you use to levelize your design? So now you have this word in your head. And it's the process by which we take something and we make sure that it doesn't have cycles. Or we observe that it doesn't have cycles. Or that it can have levels. So on. So, something is wrong with this projector. I don't understand. It is not showing. Oh, you can barely see it. It's okay. All right. Anyway, what we're going to do is instead of making you go buy the book, we're just going to talk about it right here. So, the first one is escalation, moving mutually dependent functionality higher in the physical hierarchy. So, the classic example, rectangle and box. They use each other in the interface, and they both use point. So here's an example, and you can see that they have different representations. Perhaps they represent the same value. So we'll ignore the representations and just accept that we have two different uh, possibly non-lossy exchangeable value types. And if you look here, you'll see that we have two conversion, implicit conversions. We can take a box and we can turn it into a rectangle and vice versa, right? And so this is possible because each one includes the other in the header file. Now I assume people realize this is not good, right? What? You agree? It's a cycle. It's worse than a cycle. It's a cycle in the header files. So some people fix this problem by moving the cycle to the CPP. That is not a fix. That is still cyclically dependent. We could do that. That would have less compile time coupling, but it would not eliminate the physical dependencies. The dependencies would still be there. You would still have a cycle. So you see that cycle? We need to get rid of it. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can say that boxes know about rectangles, but not vice versa. And how do we do that? We put all the good stuff in box and include rectangle. <laughs> if we do this, we have this thing here, and any time rectangle changes, people who use uh, uh, all clients of box will need to recompile. So that's unfortunate. Or we could take the other approach, and while we're at it, try to insulate the clients. So now we'll just say class box. We'll push all the good stuff to the CPP file. The problem is the same, but now only the direct clients of box will need to be modified. We'll need to recompile, okay? So that's a little bit better, but it's not really better because we would like to be able to use either box or rectangle or both. So how do we do that? Well, we need to expand. Typically what happens when you want to eliminate cycles is you have to make your design a little bigger and you need to factor it a little better. So this is how you do it. And now, we have a convert util at the top. <coughs> and you'll notice that it includes rectangle and box. 
Why does it include rectangle and box? Well, in order to support inline functions. And we'll talk more about that later. Now it also includes point. Now notice that both of these things down here include point. So why do we need to include point up there? If we're already including it in both of these, why bother? Okay, and it's a maintainability thing. Do you have anybody want to take a guess? When the rectangle or box ceases to depend on point, or ceases to depend on it at compile time. Mm -hmm. Suppose I push the dependency uh, into the implementation. I take all the inline functions out. So let's see how that works. This is what's called a transitive include. If I eliminate it, oh, and it's there also, by the way, to account for the possibility that I might need uh, to use point up there. So I might really need it. So that's just showing you that I might really need it. But suppose I take it out so it's gone. This still compiles and works just fine until one fine day we insulate point from clients of rect and box. And then that no longer compiles. This happens all the time. I can't tell you how often this happens. Code breaks for no reason because somebody downstream changes their implementation, not their interface, and code upstream breaks because they violated this rule. The rule is if you use something directly, include it directly, then you're unbreakable. Does this make sense? Okay. <coughs> uh, easily no. We have been working on it for a while and we are, uh, um, we have tools. We have Clang based tools that go around and fuss at you, but it's not easy. All right. So that's escalation. If we look, what? Uh, one question. Sure. Um, is there a specific reason you made them static functions inside a struct and not just uh, functions? Uh, okay, let's, so let's go back to that. The question is, why do I make them static functions of a struct? When I first started writing code, I made them static functions of a struct because I wanted to have a node that is a utility that no one can leech off of or do anything with or whatever. I never knew about ADL or how bad that could be and picking up other things or, or all the, the funny things that can happen. But I wanted to have a node that I could refer to that's bigger than a function. So a utility is bigger than a function. A function is too small to refer to as an individual entity. There are many other reasons why you, we use structs instead of namespaces for that. Just one of them is you can pass a struct as a concept. And we do that and we'll see that. Okay? There are a lot reasons. Oh, they go on. Most important reason is I'm old. I started that way. It works. Don't mess. <laughs> so if we look a little deeper into this, this is really all the physical dependencies. If you dig down to the file level, but we don't care about this. We know that the CPP always depends on the H, so we deal with the component as a whole. We don't care. Okay? Doesn't matter. Discussion about escalation. Good? Yes? Uh, when you said you had Clang tools that search out the, those problems, did they work? It would, be kind of, it would be kind of silly for me to say we have tools, but they don't work. We've been working on it for about two years. The Clang tools also read the doc, and if you get which versus that wrong, it will complain. So yes, they work. I'm not kidding. We really do look for comma which versus that with the tools. Clang is rather spectacular. Yes? Um, is it one? Oh, at the escalation level, it seems quite a lot of extra stuff to write. Is it worth it just to get rid of the psychic? Okay, I don't even, the question is, is it worth the extra work to get rid of cyclic dependencies? I'm going to say yes. I don't know how to convince you until you've worked on a large project that's a, bi a pile of mud. It's just, doesn't, it's just one big piece of goo, and there's no way to attack the problem at all. Then you'll understand. But if you've not worked on a large project that has these cycles, what can I tell you? But yes, it's worth it. And the, the thing is, you want to do it before the problem happens. You want to do it at the very beginning. It's easy to do in the beginning. It is almost impossible to do after the fact. 
if you don't get rid of them, they get worse. Right, all right, they're bro broken windows. The comment was, if you don't get rid of them, they get worse. If you don't let them appear in the first place, they're very reasonable. If you get in the habit of not allowing cycles and designing the whole system with that in mind, it's, it's I, just, I just don't know how to emphasize enough that there is no other way to design large systems. There just isn't. Uh, I, I, okay. Um, okay, do motion. Moving common functionality lower in the physical hierarchy. So how, what does this mean? Suppose I have an event queue and an event, and I have a list. Now, list is often some library somewhere, maybe the standard library, but the event queue and the event are tightly coupled. The event queue uses the event in the interface, but the event needs some stuff that's sitting in the event queue. This could happen, right? Could anybody imagine something like this happening, right? So there's a cyclic dependency. So let's look at what's going on. There's some common event info that the event needs to do what it does. And it's sitting in the event queue. In fact, there's a function that goes and gets it. How do we fix this? Now, this is a really important concept. This will probably hurt your head. How do we do it? We absolutely factor the common data out. See that common event info? It's sitting over there. And look at what we're pointing back to the event queue. Now, this is a cycle. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that out, just as you said. Now, the, the event queue depends in its implementation on the common event info, and so does event. Right? Now, look at that dependency graph. It's a beautiful thing. There are the level numbers. And now we come back here, and it looks like this. So take a look at this. We now move the arrows to point to the nested type. This is perfectly fine. There's no cycle here. This, this data structure has pointers going in both directions, but there is no static cyclic dependency among the components. Do you see that? No cyclic dependency. What does that mean? I can test this. I can test this. I can test that. I can test that in that order. Isn't that a nice thing? If I have the cycle, you can test it all at once. It doesn't scale. Right? I, I, I'll keep bugging you on this. <laughs> Discussion. That's a very useful technique, what you just saw telling you, that comes up all the time. Opaque pointers. Having an object use another in name only. So I have a manager and an employee. And I have my vector over there. And the manager has a bunch of employees. And if I go to an employee and say, how many people are in your group? Well, the employee is supposed to answer. That's the idea. But there's a problem with that because the manager knows about the employee. And the employee has to know about the size of the vector in the manager's world, and that's a cycle. So how do you deal with it? Well, here we have ask employee num staff. This is my little function down here. And what I do is I just return employee dot num staff. But that causes this problem because this function needs to know about manager. So how do we fix this design? The way we do it is we say the manager really owns the employee, as we all know that's true, but the employee knows about the manager in name only. Okay, and now we have this dependency because remember this doesn't cause a pound include to happen. So we have to do things a little differently. What we're going to do is the employee is not going to include the manager. The employee is going to say class manager. And nowhere in the component will the employee include the manager. And then this, this function here is going to have to change. This function here is going to be tell me your manager instead of how many people are in your manager's group. Who is your manager? I can do that. Then over here we're going to say manager is going to have the num staff function that says how many people are in your group. And then 
the final thing we're going to need here is a client. And when the client wants to know how many people work for the manager and all they have is the client, they say to the client, excuse me, could you tell me who your manager is? The client says, so I say, oh, you're the manager? How many people in your group? And so what does that look like? It looks like this. Return employee.manager points to num staff. So that's kind of cool, right? Because you don't have the, the cyclic dependency and you can get your question answered if you know how to ask it. Which is true of life, right? You just have to know how to ask, ask the question. So the client knows about both. The client has the context to exact the answer from the employee. But the employee doesn't have enough information to answer the question. Does this make sense? Yes. How can you be sure that the pointer to manager isn't dangling? One of the invariants of employees is that they know who their manager is. If you have an employee that doesn't know who their manager is, that's a violation of their invariance. Now, keep in mind, not all preconditions and invariants can hold in the presence of lunatics. So if people don't follow the rules, there can be problems. That's why we have defensive programming. So we go chase after those people when they violate the rules. So, so the assumption is, in this case, that's protected by having the employee constructor take the manager as its... Right. The manager... Right. The employee constructor has a pointer to a manager, and that pointer is required to be a valid pointer that exists throughout the lifetime of the employee. That's, that's what's required. It doesn't directly prevent the employee or the manager from dying. Right. Um, if somebody kills the manager, somebody overwrites the manager's memory and he becomes a zombie, he or she becomes a zombie, I'm sorry, you have a bug in your program. But this is how you decouple the, the physical dependencies so that they no longer are cyclic. And again, the other issues, there are many other issues to software, but if you're trying to build a system that's testable bottom up, that's how you do it. That is a way to do it. It's called opaque pointers. There, there are worse ways. You sort of covered that when you said the manager's going to own the employee. So if you give responsibility for employee creation to the manager, then it's harder to get rid of the manager and leave the employee thing. Like it, it's certainly harder to get rid of the manager if the manager owns the employee. But you could construct an employee with no manager, and people can do whatever they want. They can dereference a null pointer any day of the week. So that's fine. Any other? Did you have a point? Could you make a reference? I could, but I choose not to. I make it a pointer because I'm holding on to an address. One of our rules is when something retains the address of something beyond the function call, passing it by reference is not allowed. You must make it clear that the address is the value. And you pass something by reference, it obscures everything. So that's a rule. If, you, if it holds the address beyond the, the, the function call, it must be by pointer. Maybe a comment. It seems to me that there's a much better attribution of responsibilities. Which is? Uh, distortion because it's really not the employee. Okay, so you, you, you like this design better. It's a better uh, attribution of responsibilities. Okay, I don't disagree. All right. So, all you need to do now, give an employee, is just call this function. This is, this is a function that lives in some utility that deals with employees and managers. So clients who deal with employees and managers have a function to call to get their, their stuff done. It's all good. All right. And that's how you implement it. All right. Dumb data. So if the pointers weren't complicated enough, we can make things even more complicated. We can get rid of the, the addresses entirely. And there are reasons for doing this. And Java does stuff like this because Java wants to use indices instead of pointers often, right? For good reason. So here we have a graph. This is cyclically dependent. We can fix it by using opaque pointers, or we can do something different. And what we're going to do is look at the opaque pointers here, and you'll notice that I have nodes and edges, and the nodes know about edges, and the edges know about nodes, and they include each other, and we don't like that. So we're going to fix it. We're going to say class edge and class node, and now an edge can hold node pointers, and a node, a node can hold edge pointers, but it doesn't know what they are. And we need the graph to sort it all out at a higher level in the physical hierarchy. Okay? So that's what this looks like. But now imagine we make that go away entirely. How could we do that? 
Well, <coughs> instead of using edge pointers and node pointers, we're going to replace them with this very type unsafe indices. So now we're just dealing with ints. And now an, it's not a pointer, it's an int into a table. Where is the table? It's in the graph. So what does that look like? I have a graph and it has a vector of node, has a vector of edge, and it has these cool functions that translate ints to pointer types and so on. And if you look here, I can just give the node ID and I'll get the node pointer from the graph. So let's take a look at this guy, first edge weight. So first edge weight is implemented here as node points to edge of zero, points to weight. Now with dumb data, it looks like g edge of node points to edge ID of zero. Now go get back the pointer and apply it to weight. What's good about this? Well, first of all, there's a lot bad about it. This is a very, very low level technique. You would never hand this to a client at all. But if you're building some machinery like a simulator and you want to do this kind of thing, cool things happen here. <clears throat> you can independently externalize a node and an edge because the notion of value exists outside of process, whereas before it didn't. Before you had to, to externalize the entire graph as a unit. Now I can externalize a node because a node has a notion of value that's process independent. That's what Java does, right? At least so I hear. I don't use Java, by the way. Discussion. Um, sorry, could you just perhaps, okay, you said you could externalize, so, so another piece of software could just reference one of the nodes or one of the edges. So, so, so let me explain what I mean by externalize. If you have an object where part of its value is the address of another object in process, there is no ethereal type to represent that because that is valid only within the space of the process. However, if I tell you that I have a node, and what is a node? A node is a sequence of edge indices that are integers. That is nothing more than a sequence of integers. And a sequence of integers has a meaning outside of process so we can externalize it. Even if it's not useful, it's doable. Right? And that's, and that's different. That's what's different between opaque pointers and dumb data. So as if you were, so, so it's the same problem you run into with, like, say, writing a, an object to a file or something? Well, yeah, writing an object to a file means coming up with a representation that is I equivalent in some sense. They both, the representation you write to the file and the state of the object both refer to the same ethereal element of an ethereal type that we can talk about out of process. This is a separate talk. The notion of externalization means that there's a real value there that we can put in a database and then get back later, right? It's not process dependent. Okay. Is that not throw a bit of type safety away? Throw a what? Oh, it totally does. I, I, I did, I, these are techniques for breaking physical dependencies. They are not free. There are costs. Not runtime costs, but absolutely their type safety will be lost with dumb data. You're dealing with integers. But that's where we have tests, and that's why we write low-level, you know, uh, very fine-grained modules, and then we test the bejesus out of them to make sure they're right. Back in the day when we didn't have all these fancy types, people could still write programs and get them right and they would run quickly. But, you know, I understand this is not a high-level application technique. This is a low-level systems technique for something very, very down in the, in the guts of some sort of simulator or something. But yes, the point is this, this gets rid of a lot of the nice type safety that we have. Yes, agreed. Any other points? I'd say you can get some portion of the type safety back just by having node ID and edge ID classes. And yes, but be, okay, so the suggestion was we can have node ID and edge ID classes, but be careful because we don't want them to be dependent on each other. And so if we go back to that, we, you know, you're, you're, you're undoing the good that you did. And so separately, okay. Anything else? Up. Oh. So, 
Does this influence the order of initialization? Obviously, I guess it does. You know. Uh, initialization order could very well be influenced uh, by re-architecting re your system, I would assume. Mm, influenced, it's a really good word. <laughs> not defined. Not defined, it's not absolute. It, it, I don't know that it has to change, but anyway. All right, redundancy. Now, one of the things that people give me a very hard time for is that I repeat code. Sometimes repeating code is the right thing to do. It's not the goal, but it might be the solution. So imagine we have a system over here and a system over here, and there's some clients on the system, and there are a whole bunch of clients on this system. Now, suppose somebody discovers some redundant code. What do we do? Well, we can't have that. That would be a travesty, so we're going to do something, of course. How about is leap year? We couldn't have something as large as this repeated in our system. Well, it turns out that was wrong. It's really this. Um, but let's take something simpler like this. We absolutely couldn't repeat that anywhere, could we? That would just make the whole system go to away. So we have to do something. So what we'll do is we'll just use this one over here and we'll make this set of clients depend on this extra little piece of baggage over there. And that's not so bad. They didn't complain that loudly because it was a big thing depending on a little thing and they probably didn't notice. Now, try going the other way. Now you realize these guys are going to be very upset because before they had this nice little system and now just because somebody doesn't like the redundancy, now all of those clients are depending on all of this massive code base and that's a huge crime. Now what can we do to fix this problem so everyone's happy? And this goes back to your point about what if two modules want to use something. What do we do? We've already seen the technique. We demote it. We put it down there. Hopefully not by itself, but we put it down there. Now both are using this. That means we have to move code around. That's continuous refactoring. That's a good thing, right? Yes. And, and I, they've probably all done this, and I find in practice, we end up getting what amounts to a big garbage can that we call yules at the bottom. Is that yeah. also a crime, or is that not um, a Big garbage cans at the bottom called utils. Well, we have an open source distribution called BSL, and on top of it there's BDL, and we spend a tremendous amount of time curating exactly what will eventually go in there years before it goes in there. So if you don't have a curator, you will get a garbage can or a no man's land or a waste bucket or whatever. If you have somebody who's, whose purpose in life is to make sure that very important reusable things land effectively in the right place, then you have something like a standards committee, right? That's what the standards committee does. They make sure good things land in a good place. So you need that. There's no substitute for curation. All right. Now, if you have something like this, there is no solution that allows you to just go back because they'll complain, no way, and these guys will complain, no way. And so again, the only solution is to demote the shared resource. Now, that's when you can. And for vocabulary types, those are types that are used widely in interfaces, you don't have a choice. You must have one. But for things that are not vocabulary types, for things that are not passed around in interfaces and are more like utilities, functions that are called, maybe I have three functions that do precisely the same thing. <coughs> That's not a crime. They do it a little bit differently. They do it the same way. They could be absolutely copies of each other. That's not a crime. So let's take a look at this. Suppose I have, oh, this big thing using this nice well-packaged piece here. And it turns out that there's something at the top of this system that's just so tasty. Maybe it's some sort of mutex or little thing, but it's packaged so nicely up there. It's got all the good stuff, but I need just a little piece of it, just a little piece, and turns out I need it right here. Just a little piece. So do I do this? I hope the answer is of course not. So in you're in this situation, you say, what am I going to do? You're going to surgically go into that piece. You're going to carve out the tiniest little bit. 
and put it down there just a little bit and then look what happens over time and all these good things happen and all you did was just have the tiniest little bit of redundancy here and here and it's not so bad. So before you say there can be no redundancy in a system, think about what else could happen. This isn't so bad. If you look at this, I'm happy. Because there's, there's a point of diminishing returns and having no duplication in a system can lead you to do some really crazy things. I'm sorry, would you want to make the green? I mean, would you think about making the green box? And, um, so you, the, the green box, would you, would you think about could I move it down here? Could I move the green box down here? Not the entire green box. That's what I did. I took just the corner of this and put it down here. And now, do you want to take what you sliced out of the green box? Okay. The green box. So the question is, could I then have this depend directly on this and somehow uh, uh, just forward that functionality from here to here? Yes. That is perfectly reasonable. And that's what happens over time. What happens is, you're, you demote things and then you create, you create sort of shells and, 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 and this thing here is just a placeholder. And eventually, by the way, if the goal really were, if it were possible to move this here, you would, you would have this implemented here if it's possible. Now, maybe that all of this stuff here is needed. This needs all of this stuff to be implemented. So only that little corner that's needed down here can move. But yes, it's still possible to have that little corner refer to this little piece. It also may be that this little piece is in here and this has nothing to do with what this is doing and opening this up to have an interface to get at that functionality would be bad and we're certainly not going to make a long distance friend. So it really depends. But yes, it's possible. But it might not be the right answer. Okay, further discussion. Okay. Callbacks. One of the things that has changed a lot in 20 years is that callbacks used to be the method of last resort. And now it's not so anymore. Now it turns out there are many kinds of callbacks and we use them routinely to break cycles. But not in the crazy way that they were being used 20 years ago. <coughs> so, we can look at five different ways of breaking cycles with callbacks. So the first one is our manager employee vector example. And there's a kind of acute way where we can use a callback to break the cycle that isn't really a callback at all because when the manager here, the way we had this set up here, um, uh, we, we, had the, we had the employee including the manager and then we, we had this pointer here that would say I'm going to talk to the manager but we don't have to talk to the entire manager we can do something a little different. Suppose when the employee is created, since all the employee needs to answer is how many people are in the manager's world, suppose instead of passing the address of the manager, we pass the address of the data member in the manager that holds the number of employees. And so if we do that, then all I need to do is dereference that pointer from the employee and I'm good. And now I just need to add a little extra data here. And when I go to add an employee in the manager, after I push back this, I'm going to create a data piece of data that I can pass the address of. Because I can't pass the address of the data from the vector, but I can certainly keep it in parallel and pass the address of the shadow data member. Now again, I put this here just to give you an idea of what you can do. I'm not telling you to do this, but you could. And that would solve the problem. It's effectively demotion. What we're doing is we're having the manager and the employee both depend on a sub piece that's an int. But it's already there. It's an int. You don't have to write the class. Make sense? So it's a variation. Yes? So in the previous example, there was a tiny race condition, right? You add the employee, then you implement the encounter? A race condition. Okay. So if we're talking about, if we're talking about threading, then obviously we're going to have to worry about race conditions. But, but if, if, you're, if you thought that add employee on, on, on manager was in some sense safe in the context of multiple threads, that was never stated. And in fact, you would assume it wouldn't be, right? Unless, yeah, but, but 
you're right, but this is not a th this is not a, a, in threat enabled in any way. There's no race condition if it's single threaded. Of course. Okay. So okay. And and again, we don't write everything to be to avoid races by synchronization. We we have special classes that are written in a very different way for that purpose. Okay. All right. So let me get back to this. So data is for variation in value. Cargill pointed out that, that, that uh, in, in around 1992 that inheritance is for variation in behavior. And so we don't want to use inheritance when simple data members will get the job done. I think it was a very good observation. Which, by the way, is why we don't have uh, base classes that are values and derived classes that are special implementations of those values. That doesn't really happen in practice. Or if it does, I think it's misguided. And in fact, the standard template library has no, none of that, and it's all about values. All right. So now let's take a look at this. This is something that happens fairly frequently. We have a main program, and we want to be able, if something goes wrong, to save the client data and exit. And it turns out that right down here, something goes wrong, and we want to save the client data and exit. And one thing you might do, if you were naive, is just call the function. If problem, save the client data and exit. Now, obviously, there's a problem here, right? There's a huge problem because this is main. Here's some application. Here's some reusable library. The reusable library is calling some main component thing. It's not really a component. It's some main routine. And that's just a horrible, horrible thing. So what can we do to fix this and avoid that dependency? And the answer is... We create a new handler. The new handler lives somewhere way, way down, like in the standard. And then when main starts up, it installs, it installs that, uh, that handler. And now it's going the other direction. And so now everything is dependent this way. And we don't have any cycle at all. So this is a plain old good callback. Just like it always was. It always worked, it always does, and life is good. Um, now, I have this save at exit. Notice that it's, it has external linkage. It doesn't need to. We can take something that doesn't have external linkage and put it into the callback. Notice I'll just make it static, and now that save at exit is local to the application where it belongs. It's not crudding up the rest of the world. Not that it matters, because the main... If you own main, you can crud up the rest, of the rest of the world. It's okay. You can redefine new. You can do whatever you want to do because you own main. When you don't own main, you have very much less um, a license to do that kind of thing. All right. So anyway, so now let's take an event manager and some events. This is the standard way we used to do things a long time ago before we had all of our cool uh, uh, type safety and whatever. So we have an event manager and events, and we don't want the cycle. So any darn thing can put itself into the event manager and uh, just pass itself by a void star. And so we have this callback that says, go do something. Here's my invoke. And this is the any, any darn thing.cpp. And again, it's passing itself as a void star. Not a lot of type safety in that. But that's what we used to do, right? And then now we're going to move the move things around a little bit, we're going to use callbacks. So now, uh, uh, functors. So, so now, this invoke that used to be this function that took a void star is now just an invoke me. And we're going to change this to a function object. And we're going to change this to bind in the C++03 style. And thanks to Alistair, the C++11 style. And so now we can do much cleaner more compact, more modular, more encapsulating things. And when, oh, I'm sorry, I just, you get the idea that this is, this is not, this is the way we've always done things. We use callbacks to break cycles. That's the way we used to do it. And we still do for event-driven programming. Now, I wanted to use this example because I happen to like the game of blackjack. So I made up this example and I said, I want to create a blackjack simulator. 
And a blackjack simulator might have different pieces in action, uh, an enum, a deck, some rules, because you have different rules in different casinos. And you'll notice that in this example, the player knows about the game and the game knows about the player because they have this interaction. They use each other in the interface. And that's a problem. So we need to do something to fix that problem. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is we can say that there are abstract players and there are real players. And if we do that, then we can start playing some games like the abstract player knows about the game of 21 in theory, but the real player knows about it in practice. And by doing this, I have actually detangled all of the cycle because there is no cycle here and the game of 21 now is talking to an abstract player which is implemented this way now do you see how this do you see how this has the advantage it causes it causes uh, extra uh, overhead in virtual function calls but there's no cycle sometimes you can afford the extra overhead in virtual function calls especially when you're dealing with a game like 21 where you have human beings operating in real time there is no issue about performance perhaps that's not always the case so here I have my abstract player and the real player doesn't have to be the real player anymore now the real player could be a test player could be a network player so we just gained a lot of flexibility so this is a much more flexible and maintainable design and as I said when you want to go debug the game of 21 you have a test player and so you can orchestrate the test player to do what you wanted to do to see if the game of 21 is working before you go on and do the network player does that make sense whenever we have an abstract interface we always have a test version of that to allow clients to test their code in terms of the abstract interface before we go on to the ones that depend that way okay protocol so this technique extends to just piles of code suppose I have a cycle here I might decide to push this out and have some higher agent install this guy in an abstract interface that can then depend on this so somebody else has to install this it, you, it, it, it's no longer it's no longer right there somebody else who's at a higher level has to create you with the concrete one in terms of the abstract interface but if it works there it works even better here because this would be a real problem but then somebody at a much higher level can install this guy through an abstract interface and this guy can know about that and again this is this is a standard technique all right so now we're going to talk about the coolest one <coughs> and it's a concept and what I have here is a byte stream a byte stream is something that I use to externalize raw data and a byte stream takes it's a, it's a mechanism it takes uh, whatever data you give me and it has a bunch of methods uh, put int 8 put in 16 put in 32 put in 64 put float put double and conversely get so this is really a machine it's concrete and all of these things date time and account want to be able to use such a thing to write themselves out that's externalization and so they want to be put out on disk and they look like that when they're put out on disk and I thought this graphic was really cool so <laughs> put it here anyway so I have a byte stream and a char buff the byte stream needs a char buff to hold the data because it's a mechanism that holds state but the char buff wants to be able to write itself out to the byte stream what up with that can we have that so here's our here's our situation uh, the the char buff here's our, our char star here here our byte stream has a char buff and I want to be able to stream out to the stream and lo and behold I can't do it because they're mutually dependent so what can I do well it turns out I can do something similar to what I did before I can say I have a 
abstract stream, and then I have a byte stream. And you know, that technique worked before, but the trouble is, in this case, it's too slow. If I were to do that, it would be unusable. So what can I do? Well, what I can do is I can do something that's almost the same. I'm going to create a concept called stream. And what is a concept? Who knows? It's some, it's some magical beast over here that describes what any mechanism must provide as part of its, of its, of its um, uh, what do I want to say, as its syntax and semantics so that it does what it needs to do but there's nothing about name, there's no naming, there's no actual dependency going on. It, it just simply has to satisfy these requirements on the type. And so now if I do that, well, the byte stream can depend on the char buff and both of them can depend in theory on this thing that doesn't exist. Because it really doesn't exist. It's just saying that anything that's going to be used by the char buff that, that's here has to satisfy these structural requirements. And so the way we make this happen is we use a template method and it just says you could pass in anything you want so long as it satisfies the stream concept. And then, magically, it just goes away. That's it, because it never existed in the first place. It's just talk. And now, we have these two things and char buff can stream to anything that has the stream concept and byte stream can fully embed a char buff in it and life is glorious and I think that's really cool char buff is externalizable oh. what? you would have to actually oh. define that there with your on some old version of well the way the way it works you don't have to define anything the way it works when I go to test char buff I'm gonna have some little test stream that lets me make sure that char buff can do what it needs to do to stream itself to a test stream. Then when I get to the real deal, the, 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 uh, the, the, um, the released byte stream, the heavy duty industrial strength one, which is much more complex, it can use this happily because this has already been tested. So they are at different levels. Oh, but I just meant that you would have to expand out the definition of stream out in the header. No, I don't know what you mean by that. Define the function, right? no, 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 okay, so let me say this again. Str byte stream is an a, 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 a industrial strength implementation of something that satisfies the stream concept. The first step is I create a toy little stream used for testing, and I write char buff. Then I plug in my little toy to this, this template method, and, and I observe that char buff can stream itself to a toy. Okay. Then I write byte stream and embed char buff in it. And then I can use byte stream as the argument to this, but there's no physical cycle. That happens only during composition of the template and the, and the, and the char buff. You see, so there's, there's no static cycle. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that, but I think that what I'm saying is that you just got a, a, a member Definition, not definition, but declaration. There, you actually have to have the definition. Yeah, I do. It's a, it's a template, and it's a template. It's a template. It's a template method. So this doesn't get instantiated until I do it, and I don't instantiate it with byte stream when I'm inventing char buff. I instantiate it when I go to test it I, with a toy. I think he's bothered by the fact that the body of the template is going to be in the header file. Oh, the body of, okay, okay, the body of the template is going to be in the header file. That is true. But that's the nature of templates. Okay, so if that's what you're saying, now what you no, did is... I was just wondering if you were ahead of me and there was some magic. There. No, there's no magic, there's no magic to get rid of that. One of the things that, that and that's part of the next session, it, one of the things that, that, that we get from abstract interfaces is we get complete insulation, total insulation. One of the things we don't get from templates is insulation. So you can have your cake or eat it, but you can't have both in this case, but you can have two ways to have no cycles. And we said we can't afford, we can't afford to use an abstract interface here. And we really can't. So we have to do something else. This is the analog to an abstract interface using concepts. Okay, so that's gone, that's good, and that can be externalized. So discussion on that, well we already had some discussion. 
So I have 10 minutes left. I think I'm, I might be on track for finishing or coming close to finishing this, but it's really not necessary. If you guys have any questions, the next talk will, will go on. We probably won't even take the entire time in the next talk because we've been doing pretty good here. So do you guys have any questions about this so far? All right, well, I'm going to continue because I can. Establishing a, a class that owns and coordinates lower level objects. So I don't know if you've ever seen something like this. I saw uh, Jim Copeland talk about this once many years ago where, where he had a data structure where the data structure pointed to itself, itself, itself. It was all the same data structure. And he had a reason for it, I'm quite sure. But I didn't understand it. I certainly didn't like it. Uh, so this is not something we would ever do. Uh, we would have a list point to links. And that's the link next pointer. And then some people would say, look, I can create this, uh, this recursive function. And uh, we don't do that either. So what we do instead is we have the list manage the links. And so the list is clearly in charge. The list is at a higher level. We test the links, and then we test the list. And here you can see list depends on link. Now, we would probably not put link in a separate component because link isn't something that's, that's worth having the extra um, machinery, the physical machinery, and then we would just make it private like this, and this is what our list would look like, perhaps. <coughs> Why did I show that? Well, if you try to do something like a graph and you're very frugal with the number of classes, uh, then things get nasty. Like I could say, a node is in charge of edges, but an edge knows about nodes. I could try this. Yeah, or I could try an edge is in charge of nodes and a node knows somehow that an edge exists, I don't know. And that doesn't really work. You just can't seem to make it work. Matter. I've tried, not worth it. What you want to do is you want to say, I have nodes and edges, they know about each other in name, but that's it. And then I have a graph, and the graph is in charge of managing the nodes and the edges. And so now, the graph knows about nodes in its interface, and the graph knows about edges in its interface, and now the graph as a whole is externalizable, but not the individual pieces. And by the way, that thing about the, uh, the dumb data and allowing it to be uh, externalizable independently is of only academic interest. No one would really do that, I don't think. All right, discussion about that. Okay. Factoring, moving independently testable sub-behavior out of the implementation of a complex component involved in excess physical coupling. So, I have a widget. If the widget, think of the widget as being a TV. If I take the chassis off the TV, I have the widget imp. That's the wires and everything. I can work on that. When I get that all perfect, then I can put the box back on and make sure that the box is connected properly. <coughs> but even if I take the cabinet off of the TV, there may be things inside some of the components that I can't get to. And so here, I might extract yet something further from this. And I'll show you what this sort of looks like. Uh, this is the architecturally significant client-facing interface only. These are the private methods above uh, that become public in this class, which is then the sole data member. And these are the file scope static methods in the CPP file that no one could get at that now become part of a separate public utility. So I can test these and get them right. Then I can include them in the imp of this guy and get it right. And then I can include this as a data member in this. And that's how I test things that are way too complex to test as a single unit. Now, is this worth doing? Well, if you want something to work, yes. So because some things are just too complex to test from the outermost points. You have to decompose it into its sub-pieces. Does this make sense as a general idea? Uh, yep. Um, the, uh, the third component there, are you referring to taking the, what were static methods? Right. I would take static methods out of the CPP okay. file of the widget imp and make them static public methods of a util, of a struct. Of course. That's exactly right because the static methods of the structure do have external linkage. Right. Yep. Cool. <coughs> okay, so I have a date. 
The date class is just the carcass for the, all the machinery that, that I, we use to manage um, a date in, at, at Bloomberg, for example, because the date class at Bloomberg isn't just year, month, day. It is a whole bunch of machinery that allows us to go back and forth between serial dates and year, month, day with a huge static cache. That lives here. This is nothing. This is just a little bit of sugar. That's the beef, so we need to expose that. And you see here, I hold the serial date. No big deal, right? This one has the two serial date from year, month, day in the 60K cache. This is, this is heavyweight, this is nothing. So you wanna separate out the things that are hard to test and make them easier to test and then package them up for better consumption. All right, I think I'm gonna make this the last part. We have one more section in this, in this section, but it's, it's actually big enough that I think we'll, we'll start up next time with that. So I'm just gonna do this one. Suppose I have a network machine and cable and it's given to me as a cycle. I don't have a choice. That's in the specification. But it's too much for me to test as one big thing. What I can do is sometimes I can, well, I can, first thing I have to do is I have to put it in one component because I'm not allowed to do that. That's no good. So I put it in one component and then I say, let me see what I can pull out of cable and machine and network that are, ju are just local implementation complexity pull that down here, now I have that. Well, now that I factored out stuff from here, I can do that, that good thing, which is, let's see, I can make this smaller. So now the, most of the stuff that was here is factored out and the complexity of that component, even though it has cycles, is manageable. It wasn't manageable before, but I did, I worked on it and I factored it. So that's a good thing. And discussion about that. All right. This, whoops. What? And the, and the stuff you pulled out of the cycle, you can now test in isolation. Exactly. And even if you can't reuse it, I don't care because I can test it. Now, if I happen to be able to reuse it, all the better. I think he's waving the. Right, right. No, I know. Wait, which question? Or my comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so it was said, uh, either, well, what I'm saying is, if you pull this stuff down, you can test it independently, means this thing has a chance of being tested in, in terms of these things that have already been tested. It doesn't matter whether you can reuse this or not, at least you can test it and know you got it right. Uh, uh, oh, yep. About this, and also about that in Qtil, you still view those as a component in its full price? Absolutely, the question was, is this a component? Notice this little border here and that little circle. This is all, there's no difference between something that's an imp and something that whatever, if it's a component, it satisfies all the rules. The, the, everything's the same. It's documented the same way. It's tested the same way. There's no, sep, no special anything. It's its own component and it deserves to be treated with respect. Absolutely. All right, so as I said, this is the last escalating encapsulation, but it's more than I can get in in two minutes. So I'm gonna stop here. We will continue in a half hour or so. And if you have any questions, I'll be hanging out.